<laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, please uh, continue your uh, lunch and your coffee. Uh, we're starting a little bit uh, earlier than normal because it looks like everybody got here early and everybody's already had most of their lunch, but please do continue with your dessert. Uh, I think you all know me. I'm Keith Richburg, the president of the club. Uh, and uh, happy Mid-Autumn Festival to everybody. Uh, I think our guest needs no introduction today, but the topic is quite fascinating. Has China kept its promises to Hong Kong? Uh, we're going to hear today about how the joint declaration and the basic law promised a high degree of autonomy. And But, you know, as we all know, that uh, there have been questions raised about whether that's still true. And uh, I want to thank uh, our guests for coming here because this shows that the FCC uh, has always been since we uh, came here from China in 1949 and it remains a place where we invite everyone in uh, for all points of view and for vigorous debate and hopefully from all of you some challenging questions afterwards. Uh, Mrs. Regina Ip, uh, I'm going to shorten your bio a little bit because you've got too many degrees. It would take up too, way too much of our time to go through them all. <laughs> Three master's degrees. But I will say that you joined the Hong Kong government in 1975 and you rose to the position of Secretary for Security. And uh, you also established the New People's Party in 2011 and you were appointed a, uh, a member of the Executive Council in 2012. And uh, you, resigned, uh, you resigned from the Executive Council to run in two chief executive elections uh, in 2012 and then 2017. Uh, I'm sure you'll tell us whether three times is going to be the charm. And, uh, and you are now still a member of the Executive Council uh, for the fifth term of the Hong Kong SAR government. Uh, so, with, and you're a regular uh, guest at the FCC from occasions here past. So without further ado, let's give a warm FCC welcome to Regina Ip. Uh, Keith, uh, thank you for your very kind introduction. But you left out one key detail. Uh, I have been three times popularly elected uh, as a lawmaker. And times. I was the highest vote getter on Hong Kong Island in 2016. Uh, uh, thank you. That's I think that's a very important part of my CV. OK, I won't leave that out oh, next okay. time. Yeah. <laughs> Now you've got a presentation for us, and yeah. then we'll have Q&A afterwards. Okay, sure. Let me just remind everybody, please, if you haven't already, turn your cell phones on to silent so we don't have any interruptions. And then we'll hear uh, from Mrs. Ip, and then we'll take questions afterwards. Mm. Thank you, President Richburg, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you really for having me back. It's been a while since I last talked at the FCC, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share with you my thoughts on a subject close to my heart. You know, has China broken its promises to Hong Kong? Uh, I speak as someone who have had abundant experience of implementing one country, two systems. From very early days, uh, in the 1980s, as the subject officer on nationality, immigration, travel documents in then security branch, you know, uh, I was very fortunate to have taken part in various sessions of the Sino-British negotiations on the future of Hong Kong as a backbench expert. You know, I remember I actually, at one time, actually for my trips to Beijing, it was stamped on my um, BDTC passport. I was given a, a diplomatic visa on my BDTC passport uh, by the Chinese authorities. So quite a change of identity for me now. And then in my long and checkered career as a public servant, um, in the later, after the signing of the Sino-British uh, um, Joint Declaration, the basic law started to be uh, drafted. And again, I took part in expert consultations on the drafting of the basic law. And uh, after the, the um, an enactment of the basic law during various bells of work, my work in the trade and economic area. Again, I witnessed how the basic law was implemented. In the 1980s, China supported Hong Kong joining GATT, the General Agreement on Terrorists and Trade, as a separate contracting party. And that's very important because GATT was the precursor to the WTO and supported Hong Kong in establishing overseas economic and trade offices. As you know, being an SAR, all we, we can 
can have ETOs, but not freestanding, you know, representations, you know. So at that time, I got involved in unscrambling uh, the Hong Kong section from British Post, and we established them as economic and trade officers, and was involved in a number of negotiations for securing the appropriate level of privileges and immunities for our overseas officers. And these overseas officers are very valuable assets to Hong Kong. I think we are the only part of China which has a network of overseas economic and trade officers. Uh, they help maintain our network of overseas contacts and underscore our position as an international trade business and financial hub. And then in the early 90s, less well known to um, many media observers, is the fact that actually I also took part in expert consultations on the setting up of the Court of Final Appeal under the aegis of the Sino-British uh, Joint Liaison Group. You know. And then in 1996, when I was appointed Director of Immigration, uh, because of my background in nationality and right of all matters, I became the leader of the British team of the Sino-British Expert Group on White Harbor Boat. Later, in 1998, I was uh, appointed Secretary for Security. And as is well known, I became responsible for implementing Article 23 of the Basic Law. And it is a really a great pity that my draft bill did not get enacted. If it got enacted, it would not have been necessary for Beijing uh, to do it for Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, so I experienced firsthand how a legitimate constitutional requirement uh, to protect national security was scuttled at that time because of widespread misunderstanding of our constitutional responsibility. Uh, the implementation of one country, two systems was never expected to be painless and trouble-free. It is a bold and innovative concept, but the accommodation of a small but uh, radically different system within a large continental-sized economy is bound to be fought with tensions and challenges. To better understand its future trajectory, I think we, it will help if we revisit its original intent and purpose. You know, the first point I want to emphasize is that uh, one country, two systems is a reunification project. Um, from the outset, and I have with me a little booklet containing the words of Mr. Deng Xiaoping you know, on Hong Kong, the remarks of Mr. Deng Xiaoping on Hong Kong, dating back to 1982 all the way to 1988. Right from the start, when the concept of one country, two systems was being formulated, Mr. Deng made clear that um, China's sovereignty over Hong Kong is non-negotiable. And he said, if China did not resume exercise of sovereignty over Hong Kong, as from 1 July 1997, the Chinese government would be no different from the incompetent late Qing government and would not be able to command the trust of the people. And he promised in various subsequent meetings uh, with visitors from Hong Kong that China would ensure that Hong Kong's social economic systems, the rule of law, and Hong Kong's lifestyle, as in the early 1980s, would remain unchanged. To Hong Kong people, Mr. Deng's most memorable remarks must be his promise that Ma Zhao Pao, Wu Zhao Tiao, meaning that um, horse racing and dancing will continue because those were Hong Kong people's favorite pastimes at that time, and they still are. That's why the jockey club is uh, making records, and that's why we had a, um, a dancing dance group cluster last year because these uh, activities remain highly popular. So to that extent, China definitely kept its promise. In June 1984, in elaborating the Hong
Hong Kong People Govern Hong Kong concept, Mr. Dong stressed that the Hong Kong people filling key positions of governance must be patriots. And he defined patriots as compatriots who respect the Chinese people, who truly support China's exercise of sovereignty over Hong Kong, and who will not do anything to damage Hong Kong's prosperity and stability. I think these are very reasonable conditions. Uh, and in fact, Mr. Tung's remarks, his criteria were repeated by mainland Chinese officials last November uh, when they visited Hong Kong. One or two visited Hong Kong in person, but other senior officials did it by Zoom. Uh, they came to Hong Kong to attend a legal seminar organized by Justice Department on the basic law. In fact, last November, when these mainland Chinese senior officials came to Hong Kong, to uh, it's, it was a seminar to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the promulgation of the Basic Law. They re-emphasized the criteria for patriots to govern Hong Kong, as stressed by Mr. Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s. You know. So, so what Beijing is doing now? Is, no, is actually a continuity of uh, China's policy uh, at the very time of the inception of the concept of one country, two systems. Now let's turn to the, the recent electoral reform. The extensive modifications of our electoral system made by the National People's Congress Standing Committee in March this year sparked concerns in some quarters that Participation in Hong Kong's governance in being restricted and democratic development stymied. In fact, changes were made to return Hong Kong's constitutional development to the right tracks as originally conceived by Chinese leaders at the uh, inception of one country, two systems. Hong Kong being an inseparable part of China, it simply does not make sense for important positions of governance to be filled by people who reject China's sovereignty, discriminate against the Chinese people, or do things which undermine Hong Kong's prosperity and stability. The electoral reform ensures that those who truly uphold the basic law and are loyal to the Hong Kong SAR of China are put in charge. Now the key question, uh, uh, that I wish to address, has China broken its promise in the Sino-British Joint Declaration? You know, um, si as you know, since the enactment of Hong Kong's national security law by the National People's Congress Standing Committee on 30th June last year, repeated allegations have been made that um, um, China has restricted Hong Kong people's freedoms, eroded our autonomy, and backtracked on its promise of democracy in the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. Nothing can be further from the truth. Now, I have with me an original copy, my personal copy of the Sino-British Joint Declaration published in September 1983. Uh, I kept it as my personal copy as the subject officer at that time. It is actually, you know, um, quite a little booklet. It has 1,183 words. It consists of basically two statements by two sovereign powers and three annexes and one exchange of memoranda on nationality. Now, the, 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 as I said, two statements by two sovereign powers. The first statement was made by China. Para 1, China simply declares it will recover Hong Kong and resume exercise of sovereignty with effect from 1 July 1997. And in Para 2, the United Kingdom government declares it will restore Hong Kong to the People's Republic of China with effect from 1 July 1997. In Para 3, China outlines its basic policies toward Hong Kong in eight clauses which are further elaborated in Annex 1 to the Joint Declaration and later spelled out 
in the basic law. Clause 1 lays out China's rationale for establishing the Hong Kong SAR for the purpose of upholding national unity and territorial integrity, taking account of the history of Hong Kong and its realities. Clause 2 states clearly that the Hong Kong SAR will be directly under the authority of the Chinese People's Government and will enjoy a high level of autonomy. A high level of autonomy is by definition a qualified form of autonomy, not complete autonomy. Clause 4 says that the Chief Executive of Hong Kong SAR will be appointed by the Central People's Government on the basis of the results of elections or consultations to be held locally. So legally speaking, it's, um, there's nothing uh, unlawful for China if it wants to revert to appointing the CE by consultations. But that's not going to happen. Elections can take different shapes and forms. Nowhere in the joint declaration can we find any promise by China to grant Hong Kong a Western-style universal suffrage-based democratic system. And that, that should not be surprising. The joint declaration makes clear that Hong Kong was intended to be established under the central authorities as a special administrative region. It can have a high level of autonomy and a special international status, but never intended to be a self-governing electoral entity. In the light of Hong Kong's history, geography, and constitutional reality, any attempt to turn Hong Kong into a de facto, independent, and political entity is bound to fail. Now, what about the basic law? You know, what does it say about our constitutional system? During most of Hong Kong's history, the British administrators ruled Hong Kong as a bureaucratic polity. In the last two decades of British rule, Britain tried to remake Hong Kong's political system in the image of Westminster, but time out. There was not enough time to reach a consensus with China on Hong Kong's democratic development or cultivate a genuine, broad-based democratic culture among Hong Kong people. The last governor, Chris Patton, tried to ram through a much faster pace of democratic development without China's consent. That gave rise to a major rupturing of the transitional arrangements in the constitutional area. The through train of the pre-1997 legislature had to be stopped in the tracks and replaced by a temporary provisional legislative council which held office for one year. I think some of you, you are, who are long, long time Hong Kong citizens uh, or observers would recall fig political figures like Martin Lee holding on to the old Lechco building, re refusing to be removed uh, on 30th June, but they were removed here. Yeah. And then the Provisional Legislative Council set for one year, and then elections resumed in 1998 with a term of two years. And then uh, in 2004, elections with a regular elections with terms of four years resumed, you know, and that's the pattern we have now. In responses to the aspirations of Hong Kong people, as expressed by the members of the Basic Law Consultative and Drafting Committees, China agreed in Articles 45 and 68 of the Basic Law that, as the ultimate aim, the Chief Executive and the Legislative Council can be elected by universal suffrage, but that is subject to two pivotal conditions, gradual and orderly progress, and in the light of actual situation in the Hong Kong SAR. These conditions were formulated with much prescience and deserve to be taken seriously. Clearly, when a pandemic was raging, as in last fall, it would be contrary to public interest to hold mass elections. 
nor would it be desirable to press ahead with further rapid expansion of franchise if the community was in a state of upheaval. It is important for emotions to come down before voters can make informed, rational, and well-balanced decisions. Hong Kong's future is closely bound up with the polls held last Sunday under the revised electoral system, which puts in place a political order consistent with our constitutional status and ensures the continued success of one country, two systems. The competitive mass elections held in the past 24 years, in which I have taken part several times, have no doubt enhanced the transparency and accountability of our government. But, the, but that system became unsustainable when anti-China forces came to dominate our legislature and even attempted to use violent mass protests and electoral manipulations to enforce regime change. Under the new electoral system, there is a quantitative reduction of voters, but a qualitative improvement of the participants. The composition of the election committee is broadly based, enabling both elites and grassroots representatives to participate, united by common support for the Patriots Govern Hong Kong principle. With extreme filibuster and mindless rejection of China out of the way, the new legislature next year will be in a much stronger position to work with the executive branch to resolve Hong Kong's many deep-rooted problems. The implementation of the new national security law is bound to impose certain new limits on Hong Kong people's freedoms. But this trade-off between security and freedom is a universal phenomenon. Hong Kong's national security laws remain much milder and more restrained than similar legislation and in many other jurisdictions. Our judiciary remain, remains independent in reaching judicial decisions and robust in upholding legal principles. In the past year, our judges have made important judgments on landmark cases which strike the balance between producing the necessary deterrent effect and taking account of mitigating circumstances. Since the turmoil of 2019, we have bounced back and we have achieved high rankings in many international indices in economic freedom, public safety, human development, return to pre-COVID normalcy, and fine dining, uh, which is a very important feature of a popular international destination. No doubt, as our border with mainland China reopens and international travel restrictions progressively removed, our economic integration with the Greater Bay Area will bring unprecedented opportunities for the people of Hong Kong. My personal opinion is the future of Hong Kong cannot be brighter. Well, thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I will open it up uh, in just a couple of minutes. I just have just a couple of questions uh, for myself. Um, you mentioned a couple of times, you know, the, the LegCo members who were elected, who had this mindless rejection of China, I think you mentioned when you were talking about patriots governing Hong Kong, you talked about that they rejected China's sovereignty. You talked about these anti-China forces. I guess the question is, some might argue that you can love China, you could, if you're a Hong Kong, you can love China, you can accept Chinese sovereignty, you just don't like the Communist Party of China. Are those two things possible to separate? Um, well, I've, I've been in LegCo 13 years and worked with my colleagues, you know, and they have become more and more extreme and radicalized and anti-China. They basically objected to anything to do with China, national security legislation, no. In fact, the version I sponsor was very mild. You know, I think they need to be updated, you know. And then they objected to national education, 
they objected to uh, teaching Putonghua um, uh, in the schools. You know, uh, they objected to co-location of immigration facilities uh, in West Kowloon, and then they objected. They voted no against the national anthem, uh, the bill, and they even voted no to four tranches of the government's anti-epidemic fund. You know, they just chose to be, you know, the unthinking, determined opposition. And they are very fond of um, talking about the Wuhan virus and then um, slamming the communists. You know, they like to refer to the central government as the CCP because they know Hong Kong people's historic, traditional fear of communism. They like to play on that. And as you know, the CCP has always kept a low profile in Hong Kong until recently. I think they decided, why should we be so shy? You know, we are not a party uh, which has failed. You know, uh, we are not a party. The CCP is not a party which has presided over a failed state. Quite the contrary, the CCP has done a lot in um, re eliminating poverty in large tracts of China and help China to stand up, stand firm in the international community. So you, you have seen a, a change of policy recently that we are called openly to celebrate the centenary of the CCP because I think the Chinese authorities are fed up with all the anti-China positions and slurs in lexical. You know, so I use these words you know, I have thought hard before using these words because I have watched it happen in Lechko for 13 years. And can I ask you, uh, when I lived in Beijing, I would take occasional trips down here to Hong Kong and come to the FCC. I would buy books that I couldn't buy in China. I might see films that I couldn't see, maybe see some museum exhibits. Uh, now, now we see bookstores and libraries taking books off the shelves. We see an expansion of the film censorship regime. Uh, museums have been told to be on the watch. Is that really preserving Hong Kong's separate way of life? Well, as I said, you know, worldwide, when, whenever you have new public order or national security legislation, personal freedoms are bound to be restricted somewhat. Every country is doing that. UK has just completed a consultation on the reform of its official secrets order, official secrets act and is contemplating introducing new offenses to counter hostile state threats. You know, everybody's doing that because of the turbulent international environment these days. You know. I think some libraries, bookstores might have removed books which they thought might be unsafe out of precaution. But on film censorship, I can tell you, because I sit on that bill's committee, I deliberately joined that bill's committee to find out what's happening. You know, it only restricts exhibiting in public. You know, if you, you know, exhibit in a seminar or in a public place, then you have to comply with new rules of vetting to see if there's any national security issues. But if you play a movie at home or in a private place, uh, the, the, the ordinance, uh, the ambit of the bill does not include that sort of circumstances. You know, so it is not a across the board censorship of uh, movies uh, which might have national security issues. Yeah. Do, do you believe that the national security uh, law has allowed people to go after and criticize anything they don't like? It's become so sweeping. E we, even some of your colleagues in LegCo were saying the gay games coming to Hong Kong might violate national security. Wow. You can take that with a pinch of salt, you know, not to be taken too seriously. You know. Some of my colleagues are really into drama. You know. Not to, no worry about that. Uh, anyway. uh, yeah. And then um, uh, the gay games, uh, as you know, they have the organizer announced they will postpone the games because of the um, uh, uncertain COVID situation. They need a year to plan in, in advance. But um, I think the, the freedom of speech, although some people are, are naturally becomes a bit concerned, 
whether what they say, what they do, what they write uh, could infringe the national security law. But otherwise, I think the, the freedom of expression is still alive and well. I mean, you are carrying on business as usual. Um, and the Hong Kong Free Press is still, still operating as usual. The Hong Kong Stand News, you know, all these websites are still carrying on as usual. So I think the concerns are understandable. But uh, I don't think there is any really uh, undue suppression of the expression of freedom in Hong Kong. And do you think the Hong Kong Journalist Association will be able to carry on as usual? It really depends on evidence. You know, I don't know what evidence. Uh, uh, I'm not privy to the police investigations. I don't know what evidence they have in hand. And last question for me, and then I do want to get questions from the audience. You did run for chief executive twice. You didn't get the nomination. I know you don't want to announce anything here at the FCC, but feel free if you do want to. But do you think you could do a good job? Well, I, th I tried two times, really, for fun. <laughs> it, uh, it was a good learning experience, you know. I think um, whether I would run again, I think that's really a premature question. That no, no one would answer at this stage, you know, because as I explained the law to you, you know. When, when would that decision have to come if the elections are in March? Um, when the nomination period starts in January, you know, the, the candidates will come forward. Would you consider coming back here to make your announcement to the FCC? Uh, well, I think that's really a hypothetical <laughs> question. <laughs> well, thanks very much. I'm going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. I see Cliff Buttle's hand was first, so please, uh, would you please identify yourself just for the record. Uh, Cliff Buttle, uh, work for the South China Morning Post, um, and I am a journalist governor uh, at the club. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to ask uh, Regina, you. Um, in one of your recent uh, columns in the SCMP, you said that the uh, democracy was an experiment that had failed in Hong Kong. It had, it had not worked well, and you, you've elaborated upon that today. Um, you've also talked about universal suffrage being included in the basic law um, because of the aspirations of Hong Kong people. Um, <clears throat> We've just seen uh, an election for the election committee in which some 4,000 people got to vote out of a population of more than 7 million. There are many people in Hong Kong who are not anti-China, who support one country, two systems, who want the best for Hong Kong, and yet have no vote, and even if they did have a vote, I suspect there would be no candidate for them to vote for. What would you say to those people who feel that they have been disenfranchised by these reforms? Uh, and can you offer any, any hope to them for the future? Thank you. Well, the people of Hong Kong, they have been enfranchised for only 24 years. For most of our city, they never had the, the right to vote we were governed under the classic British colonial model, you know. Governors were appointed, and that model really worked very well, you know. Um, naturally, we are in modern times, and a lot of people want to have ownership in the governance of Hong Kong. Nothing wrong with that, you know. But um, the past 24 years, as I said, have brought many advantages much greater transparency and accountability of our government, but also a lot of disadvantages. Too much uh, divisions, polarization, filibuster in our legislature, um, making it difficult for the government to deal with the real problems, the real issues of our city, a lot of the very pressing issues of our city, like land and housing shortage. And our pan-democratic colleagues would filibuster even land formation in Yunlong for building public housing estates. You know. And that has really held back Hong Kong's development. So I think um, it is worth reflecting, sitting back, thinking about which is the best model for Hong Kong. 
You know, even in the West, whether in academic circles or in wider circles, there are debates on what sort of model of democracy works best in modern times. Personally, I prefer the Aristotelian model, that is for the middle, for the communi political community to be held by people in the middle. You know, not two to the left or not two to the right. And in, in the past few years, ever since Occupy Central, Hong Kong had veered too much to the right, to the left, to the anti-China side. And I think we need a cooling down period. You know, and I'm, I'm not saying, I don't think um, Beijing is saying that we cannot go back to broader based universal suffrage elections. In fact, under the new system, we still have to work out new forms of checks and balances. That's why you saw candidates, um, including myself, already a de facto member, you know, handing out flyers on the street two weekends ago and uh, using my loudspeaker to explain the new system to the people in Sha Tin. In fact, that had the effect of encouraging some elderly people to go to the polls last Sunday, even though they did not have the votes. You know. So I think we, are, we have had a broad uh, and democratic experience based on broad franchise. My personal view is that that has not worked well for Hong Kong. And it's about time we uh, go down a different route, which is consistent with the constitutional design and reality of Hong Kong, and see how it works. Mm. Can I follow up on that? Just yeah. Once? Uh, under the new electoral system, once everything is sorted, you're going to have you're not going to have the polarization. You're not going to have the filibustering. You're not going to have the pan Democrats. Isn't that going to increase the burden on you and the legislature and the government to actually solve problems like income inequality, housing not being affordable? What you have no excuse then? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, when my pandemic colleagues departed in November, we were actually, um, you know, quite taken aback that we had to play the role of the opposition. We can't shift the blame to them. You know, they they're no longer there. They're not there know. anymore. We have to take responsibility. And 41 of them have to work very hard in the past few months to sit on many panels and build committee. And we certainly have a diversity of views in, government, in the legislature. For example, on whether to ban e-cigarettes and heat not burn cigarettes uh, completely. You know, the only difference is maybe our differences are not so openly expressed and can be amicably settled. But there remain tensions in our legislature. Yeah, first here. Um, yeah, um, George Long here. Um, in the international community, there's a lot of, especially the business community, a lot of frustration and disillusionment over the handling of COVID. What I hear talking to my colleagues, actually, the national security law, while no one likes it, isn't really the issue. It's the how badly COVID has been handled. And lots of people are now talking about leaving and moving their businesses elsewhere because of that. But, so I, I, there's a sense that the government doesn't care uh, about the international, Hong Kong's international business center. But my real question is, what, how should the international community engage with Hong Kong politically and in terms of the political discussion and engage politically in these kind of issues? Because we want to stay here and build, build our businesses here. Um, thank you for that question. Um, in fact, the, the members of ICSCO who have, been re who have received the most complaints from the international community, they are Laura Cha, Bernard, Bernard Chen, and myself, you know, and we have received loads of complaints you know, from in the international business community as well as families with um, children studying abroad. You know. And we have done well in, in, a, in the sense of containing the spread of COVID. You know, we have zero infections for more than a month now. And the economists rated us 96% uh, back to normalcy. But I know the restrictions on the, the long quarantine period uh, in effect restricts international travel. Uh, the good news is, as Mrs. Lam reported, after her recent meeting with the Vice Premier 
Japan in uh, Guang Shenzhen. Um, they will be setting up an expert group on reopening um, the borders with the mainland. You know. uh, probably not a complete opening up, but uh, quotas uh, for people with um, very pressing need, whether it's families or business. And we also have to um, beef up our systems in a way that conform with the mainland's requirements. As for the restrictions on international travel, because of our 21-day quarantine period, it really depends on the situation overseas. You know, if there are a thousand cases a day in Singapore, you know, or you know, a, a continuous upsurge of cases in UK or US, we have to keep them in category A. You know, UK was uh, upgraded to A a month ago. So uh, the, the situation is uh, highly volatile, but um, we will continue to work hard uh, so that we can reopen the borders with the mainland as well as control the, the spread of COVID from overseas and make it less harsh for people to travel outside Hong Kong. The priority is the mainland border, not overseas travel. Uh, both are important to us, but uh, you know, if we are not safe, we cannot open our borders with the mainland. I saw two more. Yes, the lady here first, and then over here, and then I'll look on the side. Hello, Mrs. Lip. My name is Shirley, and you used to write for ICMP. So I've got two questions for you. First question is, what's your vision for Hong Kong after 2047? So that's question number one. And question number two is, recently, the Chinese government is ring fencing different industry from property to technology. And a few days ago, the Chinese government rumors, the Chinese governments have asked the property developer here in Hong Kong to help the poor because housing has always been an issue in Hong Kong. And my Dutch husband has um, often classify me as a socialist. So I was just wondering, on the housing issue, do you think the Hong Kong government might think about how to push this forward? Because I know in the UK, they have affordable housing scheme, which means when the developer develop certain amount of units for sale, they also have to carve out certain units as affordable housing. So those are my two questions. Well, I'll, I'll take the, uh, one of your points first, the, the story about uh, Chinese authorities talking to Hong Kong developers, you know, uh, looking for cooperation from them. I don't think that has been fact-checked. I don't believe that as a, a real story. I don't think that is really what chi Chinese authorities said to us. Hong Kong developers, you know, I doubt it. You know, the whoever reported might have talked to a few mainlanders. You know, I think it's really overblown. You know, and um, the I don't think there is any monopoly or duopoly or even cartel in the property sector in Hong Kong. You know, um, we have very high home prices because of land shortage. And I agree with Oriental Daily News comment today that the high home prices is in a sense due to our own high land price policy, which Hong Kong has always adopted since 1842 as the most reliable source of revenue because we have a very narrow tax base. Now, if we want to adopt the Singapore model of having 80% public housing, we will forego a lot of land premium, and the government must work out how to balance the budget. In fact, I asked a logical question recently as to why the government cannot ask the MTR, which has two monopolies, a monopoly in building railways and a monopoly in the best top side development sites of Hong Kong. You know, why can't we ask, put a scheme of control of profit control on the MTR 
and make the MTR cough out, you know, the properties they have developed in excess of the, their profit allowed under the scheme of control, say 8%, as applicable to the power companies, and have those units as public housing, home ownership, starter schemes, new home ownership schemes for the middle class. I raised that question, and the answer for the Treasury uh, for the Secretary for Transport and Housing is very significant because he started by saying that after consultation with my colleague, the Secretary for Treasury, uh, we, we don't intend to change our policy toward the MTR, clearly because they have the land premium in mind. So I think we need a radical, my personal view is, we need a radical rethink of our land and housing policy. If we are going to boost the public sector, we must work hard on restructuring our economy and getting new ways of raising revenue. I think she asked about your vision for 2047. Oh, um, I think again it's premature, you know. But I think whatever is good, whatever has worked well under one country, two systems will remain. You will notice under the 14 five year plan, Beijing stressed Hong Kong's position not only as an international financial center, also as an international transport shipping center, but also as an inter a center for the interaction of uh, Western and Chinese cultures, that sort of thing. I think they highly treasure the international dimension of Hong Kong. In fact, that's our main, our key competitive advantage over other fast-growing mainland Chinese cities who want to eat our lunch. Uh, one more question over here, and then we're going to go to the veranda. Um, hello, uh, Jessica Park, FCC member. Regina, you can relax. I don't write for anybody, <laughs> just just myself. Um, I've been in Hong Kong 62 years now, and I, I love the place. And I'm delighted to see China developing so well and raising so many people out of poverty and having space stations and, and getting uh, ships to land on the moon. and uh, and there's so much to be proud of, and, and I think we're all very proud of so, so much of that. And also, of course, we're very proud of Hong Kong. Uh, but there's some things that stink a little bit. And um, we, we, you, you talked earlier about um, the CCP or the, or, or the, the uh, uh, government, uh, head government in Beijing, wh whatever we want to call them. But, but the reputation of the CCP in some areas um, isn't very good. We have the, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and people have classified that as, as um, um, what's that word I'm looking for? Genocide. Um, China doesn't have an open policy so that nobody can fact check, as you like to uh, comment on uh, so often. We can't fact check those accusations. China hides that. And therefore, one has the suspicion, right or wrong, that genocide is, is being committed in China. And therefore, we can't feel proud about uh, the CCP. Um, if you look at human rights lawyers, um, they get imprisoned when they're trying to defend human rights individuals. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are courts in China which are not open to the public. We don't know what's going on. Uh, when it comes to the South China Sea, we just see a bully boy tactic. And, and, and China may well have uh, its thoughts and ideas about the history, but the only thing that counts is their thoughts. And so that there's lots um, of good things, and there's lots of terrible things going on. Um, and I was just wondering how we can resolve some of those issues, which, uh, so it's not all good, it's, uh, a lot of it's good, a lot of it is bad. Can we work on some of the bad place? Thank you. Some reaction to that? Well, I'll respond to your last comment, that there are lots of good things about China, and lots of bad things that you disapprove of. I think that saying goes to of many countries. Well, I won't be able to respond to each and every one of your criticisms of China, but what I can say, I don't know whether you've been to Xinjiang. You know, the, from what I know, there are 15 million Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Some of them are doing very well. You know, so that can hardly justify genocide. So the Western rhetoric has moved from genocide to forced labor. And according to my colleague, Andy Zhang, the former clinician of police, who have visited some of these 
vocational and retraining centers. They are really, according to Andy, these are really centers for de-radicalization. You know? And um, so I think um, we must be very careful um, in, in making these allegations without really hard evidence. You know? And there are, of, of course, um, areas for improvement in human rights, not just in mainland China, but in many Western democracies. I, I don't want to point fingers, but uh, this is a perennial problem. We all have to try our best you know, to strike a balance uh, between protecting the stability and harmony of the nation and upholding individual rights. Uh, in the middle, on the veranda. Von File. Regina, thank you for your comments. Very useful. Um, I'm just a little bit at a loss. How can we, a rhetorical question, how can we be an international financial center with no English? Because we all know that what's happened to that here. And are there any plans afoot to get to rejuvenate English in Hong Kong? The mainlanders seem to be grabbing market share there big time. Well, mainland China is, um, you know, um, have issued no new rules about tutorial schools because they want to narrow the gap between the education attainment between children from privileged families and children from uh, poorer families. Um, the degradation of English standards in Hong Kong is, in my view, a problem. You know? um, um, because of the change of the language environment since 1997, less English is being used and spoken. Uh, that is a reality, you know. But we still have uh, very good schools in Hong Kong, international schools, direct subsidy schools. You know, our international schools, ESF, for example, have always had the highest percentage of uh, top IB students. And even among local schools, um, students of which have worked for me, we continue to be able to produce some students with very good English. Uh, it is something that uh, we must continue to work hard to preserve our advantage over the rest of China. Thanks for your reminder. We've got time for one more. Oh, right here. Uh, Anna Healy Fenton, past president of the SEC. Um, sorry to raise the specter of COVID again, this is it, and we are all very privileged and thankful and lucky that we have been in Hong Kong during the pandemic. I think we all appreciate how quickly we've got back to normal. However, the elephant in the room remains the vaccination rate. What is your idea on the best way to increase the vaccination rate? Well, we have tried raffle draws. I even offer my Rolex watch. You know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the problem is, number one, we have an aging population. You know, the vaccination rate is very low among elderly people. And secondly, because we basically have, I think, only 12,000 cases and 200 odd deaths. And I know a lot of old people who really think that uh, they won't die if they don't try vaccination, but they might die if they try vaccination. So the government and the, the vaccination rate is going down. I look at the figures yesterday, it's below 10,000. It shot up to 40,000 at one stage. It's the elderly that we are stuck at, this, at, at, the, at present. So I think the government is sending outreach teams to elderly centers, you know, getting voluntary sector to help. Um, you don't have to um, register for quotas in advance. You can have it done instantly, sending outreach teams to elderly homes various centers to, to do the vaccination. I think we are about 62, 63% vaccinated, you know. And uh, you know one developer offered another apartment if we get up to 70%. So I think we have to keep working on that. And as you know, I am now triple vaccinated, <laughs> you know. And I feel fine mm -hmm. with my third Biontech shot, you know. So I do encourage older people to get vaccinated. But thank you very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Zip. I think you would find the FCC a friendly audience, but yes. some good challenging yes. questions, but always, always fun. And we'd like to welcome you back. And just as a way of saying thank you, we have a small gift. 
it's not just the tote bag, there's something in the tote bag as well. <laughs> so you can, a mug? Uh, you can if you'd like. Yeah, yeah is it an FCC mug? I think it probably yeah. is. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, please take that as a token of our appreciation. And please promise us you'll come back. Is yellow your or has always been your color? It's always been the color. No, okay. <laughs> blue and yellow. Blue okay. and yellow. No, no problem. Blue and yellow. No. This is neutral stage. It's blue behind you here. So. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank We've you. got everything covered here. Oh, thank you. So please come back. Yes. And particularly if you want to make any announcements, we'd be the perfect place, the perfect platform next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you all for coming to lunch. Please keep an eye out on fcchk.org for our upcoming events, and we'll see you all at the next lunch talk. Take care. Thank you.